Welcome to Cross Community Church. If God is good, can we give him some praise this morning? Come on. We want to welcome everybody watching online and those of you obviously who are here in our, our presence today physically. Uh, those of you who are online, you are with us spiritually and you are a part of Cross Community and we love you. And this morning I am excited because God is absolutely on the throne, and I want to share a word with you. Everybody say, I'm ready, Pastor. Today, I want to speak on the subject. If you want to call it a topic, you can call it a topic. But I want to speak on the subject this morning of celebrating other people's blessings. I want to say that one more time. Celebrating, everybody say other. Celebrating other people's blessings. I don't know about you. But when things are going great for me, and things are going wonderful for me, and something great and wonderful happens to someone that I know, it's a whole lot easier to celebrate. But I want to pose some questions to you before we dive in, and because I think this is so important today, this is something uh, that I, I dug pretty deep in, in, in trying to find the, the, the right text and the right verse in order to relay this message today. In a moment, I'll be in Romans chapter 12. But I want to pose a couple of things to get our brains working to make sure that we're awake and alive today. I do want to encourage you, if you have uh, a device or anything that might, uh, that might distract you, maybe you turn that off if you're watching from uh, wherever you are. Just make sure, maybe try to turn off all your distractions. But I want to ask a question, and, and this is for us to think about, right? How do you feel when they, everybody say they, isn't it interesting how a lot of times when we want to put, put blame on someone, we just use this group called they. There's always a they. They need to do this, and they shouldn't have done this, or I'm glad they did this, or I wish, I wish they would do something about it. And, and sometimes God is not calling they to do it. God is calling you to do it. Amen to that. But, but how do you feel? When they get blessed, because see, it's one thing for you to be walking in a great season of blessing and, and, to, and to be excited about everybody else getting blessed, but how do you feel when they get blessed and guess what? You don't. How do you feel when they get blessed? Crate me up just a hair. I took all kinds of medicine this morning so I could speak today. Don't you pray I lose my voice. But how do you feel when, when they get blessed with what you were praying for? Oh, oh, how, how do you feel when they get blessed and you know that they aren't as spiritually solid as you? Oh, how, how do you feel when they get blessed and they only worked for it for like two weeks and you worked for it for like six months or two years? How do, how do we feel? I mean, I'm just, I just, you know, we're a real church. If you're listening for the first time, we just get real at Cross Community because we have a real God and a real Savior who understands and knows how to reach us on a real level. Can somebody say amen this morning? I'm feeling good today. I had a good day of fishing yesterday. But anyway, so I, anyway we're going to fish for men this morning, right? So how do you feel? Please don't tell me right now. <laughs> but you think about it. I've been saving up for a new car, and you just went and got it. You ever had anybody buy something, the exact same thing you wanted to buy, but they got to it before you, and then you were going to feel like a copycat if you bought it too? I heard some laughter in here. That's the things we think about. Some of you are like, I don't care. I'll do it anyway. Well, I, I, I'm proud for your strong personality and your ability to do that. They're still going to call you a copycat, but anyway. But how do you feel... When they get blessed and you don't, and even, even a little further, I think this stretches us. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is, this is things pastors deal with. Everybody deals with this, you know, on some level, unless you've mastered it and praise God for you if you have. But how do you feel when they get blessed with something you wanted? Everybody say wanted. How, how do you feel when they get blessed with something you wanted? In other words... When she got the engagement ring, don't you say amen, right? When, when, when she got the ring that had more carrots to it than, than, than uh, Bugs Bunny ever ate. Come on, somebody. For those of you listening, I know the difference. It's just, it's just a joke. 
how, how do you feel, the spelling is, even, anyway, how, how do you feel when, when, when you failed the test, but your buddy nailed it? Come on, anybody in the church, right? How do you feel when they got the promotion, and you should have gotten it, but you didn't? How do you feel when they got that big deer and they mounted that thing on the wall and, 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 and all they did was climb up in their mobile home with heating and air and everything else in there and, 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 and had, they just had it laid out for them and, and you worked so hard to shoot that deer and by golly, you're, you regret letting them be in your stand that day. And some men are like, oh, I don't like it. You shouldn't have shot my deer. Come on, guys, how do you feel when you've worked hard in your yard and you don't know why it doesn't look as good as theirs and you've worked so hard and then somebody else just moves in next door and two weeks later their yard looks like it's going to be yard of the week, yard of the month, yard of the year. People are gonna, companies are going to start calling your neighbor and asking them, how is your yard so nice? How do you feel when they build the house and you don't? How do you feel when they get the boat and you don't? How do you feel when that person found somebody to marry? Like, that person actually found somebody to marry and you haven't. Y'all are quiet with that one, but we all got some buddies. You're like, if, if he can find a wife, come on, somebody. If there's somebody for him, there's got to be. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Oh, the fake smile. Oh, that's just great and wonderful. I'm so glad you, you. How do you feel? How do you feel, ladies? And, 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 and look, I don't mean to be sexist at all. I mean, men do it too. I, I, I try and wash and do clothes too. It's a new world. It's a new generation. I get it. Okay. How do you feel when you got the cheaper model of the washer and dryer, right? And you're pretty excited about it. And I mean, three minutes later, it's because Facebook is always listening or social media is always listening. Your buddy posts a picture of the ones that you really wanted. That basically, they just, you, that basically you just throw clothes in it and it washes itself. I mean, y'all wish you had one of those. Ours has an annoying ding to it, and very often I've had to practice self-control. It sings to me until I per turn it off, and it drives me crazy. Can anybody in the room help me out? Just feel sorry for me this morning. Uh, feel my pain. Pray for me. It angers me when that thing sings to me. If I want somebody to sing to me, I'll turn on the radio. But anyway, how do you feel when they get the stuff the, the, I was going to buy that pair of shoes, and buy, why did you do that? You got the off-brand lawnmower, and here they come through riding that expensive John Deere. costs more than your car. I'm not talking about the Home Depot version. I'm talking about the, from the John Deere place. How do you feel when you get the above-ground pool, and all of a sudden they got tractors and everything coming in there, and they get the giant, like, Olympic-sized pool, and now your kids don't want to go to your pool anymore? can't believe they went out and did that. I know they put that on I know they put that on a credit card. I don't know how they drive all those vehicles and have all that stuff. How do you feel? Now I've talked a lot about material blessings. That's you know. How how, how do you feel when their kids are actually good kids? <laughs> Come on, anybody. How do you feel when their kids got out of diapers at like, I don't know, this is an exaggeration for those of you listening, but like three and a half months, and you feel like you're at three and a half years? Like, h how do you feel? How do you feel when, when, when they just come home with great grades and it's so easy for them, but you don't understand, like, how do you feel when somebody just sort of aimlessly gets to where you want to be in life, and then... It's taking you more time. You see, there's a question, and I'm going to share a verse with you, where the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, he kind of, I won't say he skips around, I don't know if that's fair to say he skips around, but he starts hitting some specific subjects about how Christians should relate to one another, and uh, just sort of this daily activity in living amongst other people or other believers, and I, I think that it would, 
it would cross the lines, if you will, to, to loving other people the same way. And he's going to say something that I think we do a good job with, but he's also going to say something that I don't know that we do the, the best job with. And you might fake it, and some people say fake it till you make it, and, and, and you know, some people say a lot of things. But I want to show you this text. It says in Romans 12, 15, it says, rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. Okay. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice, right? And weep with those who weep. And I think that we do a lot better job with weeping with those who are weeping. How many of you uh, would much rather be the comforter than the one that needs to be comforted, okay? How, how many of you would love to be the person that's there for your friend while they're going through a hard time rather than being the person that is having the hard time? In other words, I think as believers, a, a, as people sometimes that even aren't believers, that, that when something goes wrong in a friend or family member's life or whatever the reason is for crying, you know, like, like, we still haven't been back to the Super Bowl since 96. Those, that's a good reason to weep. But anyway, like, as long as your team is winning, it's a whole lot easier to be there for other people. But I, I love this verse because it says something about believers. And the reason why the Bible tells us things is because obviously we need to hear them. And the reason why the Bible gives us directions oftentimes is because if we didn't have those directions, we wouldn't understand how we're supposed to relate to one another, how we're supposed to feel, and how we're supposed to think, and how we're supposed to respond, and how we're supposed to react. And I don't know about you, but even ourselves, even when we know how we're supposed to, and we know the Bible verses, sometimes it's still hard for us to do it because we get into our flesh. But here's a different challenge for us today. And I'm bringing it up because I've had this happen personally uh, very recently. And I'll kind of leave it broad and open so that you can fill in the blank for yourself. Are you good at rejoicing with other people when good things happen to them? In other words, is your first reaction, well... I don't have that. Are you good at rejoicing when that guy goes to the gym twice and drinks 75 Mountain Dews a week and he has a six-pack and the only thing you have is a six-pack of Mountain Dew? You didn't know what I was going to say, did you? you? You wonder, you were like, ooh, where's he going there, Pastor? I'm listening. I'm listening. He said six-pack. How do you rejoice with people when you're not in a season of rejoicing? We should, you should always be thankful. For them. Yes, you should. And, and that's very biblical, and I preach that, and I teach that. I know that. I, we can always find something to be thankful for, even in the hardest of times. Can we agree to that? But sometimes, y'all, rejoicing with others. But why would God tell us to rejoice with my brothers and sisters? when they're in a time or a season of rejoicing. You see, we have sometimes in us, because of the fallen nature of man, because we have been taught uh, by the world, not necessarily by the church, we've been taught by the world to think about us. Because if you don't think about yourself, then, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes. If, if you don't think about yourself, it's kind of hard to get somewhere, right? It's kind of hard to do stuff. If you don't look out for you, right? And the Bible teaches all kinds of things about that. It actually says, put others in front of you. There's various things the Bible teaches about loving our neighbors and taking care of them. In this very materialistic world that we have, in this world in which we compare our lives to those who uh, are on Facebook or, or Instagram or Instaham and whatever they are. Uh, you know, that family picture they took might have taken 15 minutes and everybody was smiling, but no one was happy. I just, I don't know if you know that or not, right? And we're sort of comparing our lives to them saying, if I could just get what they have, I'll be happy. If, I, I would rejoice if I had that too. And, and I think God has a lesson here. For us to understand, one pastor who, I don't always agree with everything the guy says, 
It's kind of hard to agree with everything everybody says when you have your own head on your shoulders, right? But Andy Stanley calls it the comparison trap. And I believe a lot of what he says and some things I don't. I mean, he's, he's, he's a man just like us. But he calls it the comparison trap. What happens is if, if, if I'm always comparing my life and the things that I do to other people and what they have, and, 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 the, and the spirit of rejoicing only comes on me when I am getting what they have and doing what they do. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I think you know where I'm headed. It is vital, ladies and gentlemen, that we learn, as Paul said in Philippians 4, it is very vital that we learn to be content with what God has given us and to rejoice with what God has given us, but also rejoice with those that you may perceive are in a season of rejoicing, or they have something you don't, or maybe they just got what you have, and now you feel like there's a rivalry, or whatever. All of the stuff that goes through our minds. We need to learn that when something happens, I'll put it in church terms for you. If God chooses to bless another church in Crittenden County that is a Bible-believing church, then our church should absolutely rejoice with them because there are plenty of people in Crittenden County to go around that need Jesus. In other words, they are not taking our turf, all right? Christians are trying to reach everybody. In other words, there is room for them to be blessed and us to be blessed. Come on, somebody. And so we, we just... I had to pose this question. I've not preached about this um, specifically very often, if ever specifically Romans 12, 15. And I've been preaching for a long time, and i got a lot of hours, and i got a pretty large degree. But I don't really hear this talked about a lot. Because what it does is when I can't rejoice with other people, and I can't be thankful and happy when other people get stuff, it can cause all kinds of little small divisions that no one may ever realize that's around. You may treat them differently, think of them differently. Jealousy and envy and unrivalry, all of these types of things can start to, to consume you because you're more consumed with what they have rather than what God has given you. And so I want to tell you this morning, and this was almost a whole sermon, by the way, but I added a little something extra at the end because I thought it would be too short. And if I'd have polled the audience, you'd have said, Adam, that's plenty. Bring the worship team back. And if I drag it out a little bit longer, maybe we will. I don't know. I mean, you, you, you pray for what, you know, anyway. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. And I am obviously preaching to me, too. Whenever I'm preaching, I'm preaching to me. I'm with you. I understand my authority as the pastor. I'm called to do what I'm called to do, and I'm going to do it. But I also understand... That God's word to you is also God's word to me. It's God's word to us. Look for opportunities to rejoice with others this week. Look for opportunities to rejoice with others. There are some examples I could use, but you might know who I'm talking about if I did it. If you're ready for part two, say, I'm ready. All right, the rest of you can, uh, just kidding, please don't leave. Here's part two of today. So part one, celebrating other people's blessings. Let other people's blessings be an encouragement to you. But also, chasing other people's blessings. Everybody say chasing. And hang on a minute, i got to get some water. Chasing other people's blessings. Now, you've noticed that there's either a major typing, a typo error, or I have purposely put the ER there for a reason, and I'm not talking about the emergency room. But there is something that sort of happens, and I'll take you to Ecclesiastes 4 in just a few moments, minutes, hours. It'll, I'll be in Ecclesiastes 4 eventually. But sometimes... Maybe it's not so much 
rejoicing with others when they get blessed or rejoicing uh, when they're rejoicing. Maybe you're re maybe maybe they're so strong in the Lord, they're rejoicing and you're like, man, I want to be there. And, and, and th there are certain things that are OK to chase after. But what I'm relaying to you today is that there are some things in our lives that we're chasing that don't produce fruit. And so if I'm chasing other people's blessings, what do you mean? Well, it's the er. It's they've got the big er, right? They got the rich er. They got the handsome er. Uh, grammar teachers, I apologize for that one. They got the pretty er, right? That one actually works. They are, they have the nicer, you fill in the blank. They are faster at fill in the blank. They are smarter at fill in the blank. They are taller at that one. Don't you make fun of me. They are cooler than me. Their personality is better than mine. They are more outgoing-er than I am. You like that, don't you? I'm just creating stuff. Right? They are more athletic-er than me. And what happens is you, you live in, in what Andy calls the land of er. And so I don't really rejoice with others when they rejoice. And now I'm letting these other people and these errs tell me what I need to achieve and get in order to be happier. And so we're living in the land of Ur, and I think this is a very big problem, a very big problem, Ur, <laughs> for us. Because God wants us to be chasing after him, and God doesn't want us to be chasing after the Ur's. So in no way, I'll take you to Ecclesiastes. I want to show you this. This book of the Bible, uh, the pastor um, he, he's actually gone on. I don't know if he's still pastoring or where he's pastoring now. But as a high school senior, he took us through the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, for those of you who feel like I graduated last year, that was actually 2002. So thank you. So that was a long time ago. Long enough to raise a grown man or woman. But he took us through the book of Ecclesiastes. And it, depending on the translation that you read, there's sort of something that kind of repeats itself through the book. Now, we believe that so uh, Solomon had a lot to do with this book, right? And Solomon, full of wisdom, God blessed him with it. There's some of these phrases that come. You'll see a chasing of the wind. You'll see meaningless, meaningless, meaningless throughout the book, right? And it, you start reading it, and you're like, this dude must be depressed, <laughs> right? Like, he's got, if you think about it, he had everything he wanted, right? As a man, he had all the money, all the power, all the riches, all the women. I mean, all kinds, all kinds of counseling issues for Solomon, okay? He had all the errs. Solomon had every err that, that you could place on anything. And so he, he had such a, he, he, this is why this book is so important for us. Because he's, he's looking at life, and he says, Then I saw that all toil, all this work, and all this stuff, and all, all of this, all, the, all that we do that we would consider in this context toil, okay? And all the skill and work, everybody say work. It says, it says they come from a man's envy of his neighbor. Er. <laughs> now, I'll pause for a moment and say this. Absolutely nothing wrong with working hard. Absolutely nothing wrong with having a vision, a God-given vision, and chasing that vision. Absolutely nothing wrong with having passion. Absolutely nothing wrong with a strong work ethic. Absolutely. Listen, listen. God put that on man. Nothing wrong with having a strong drive and wanting to accomplish goals. The problem happens when we deceive ourselves 
and we are chasing after other people's goals so that we can re we can receive and walk in some type of of happiness and fulfillment because we got what others had or have and so he says that i saw that all toil and all skill and work it says it comes from a man's envy of his neighbor it says there, this also, and I think I'm reading from the ESV, is vanity. And some translations will say a chasing after the wind. This one says, and a striving after the wind. He goes on to say, but I wanted to find envy. Everybody say envy. And I want to really actually define it because if you go to, uh, you can go to a website called blueletterbible.org, I believe. You can go check that out. Anyway, you Google that later on. Uh, great place to find some word meanings, and seminary was a great tool for us. But envy, you, you're, you're going to see this, and I've got to explain it. Excited by the prosperity of others. Now, that, that's not the like kind of excited that, that I'm excited and I'm pumped about worship today. I'm excited and I'm pumped about reading my Bible today. I'm excited and I'm pumped about watching my show tonight. I, I'm excited in, at th this level of, uh, I'm excited at, 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 at what the day might hold. It's not that, it, it, this is the type of excited that, that, that catches your mind. It is an excitedness or, or it, it gets you, it, it's, it's something that you see that other people have, and it causes something in you to change. In other words, it, it raises your eyebrow, if you will. It changes what your focus is, and it looks at the prosperity of other people, and it becomes envious of them. It includes a resentment of what others have that we don't. A resentment of what others have that we don't. Oftentimes, I see this with people who are very wealthy. And I see people, um, sometimes we want to talk bad about somebody who maybe God blessed with wealth. And, and, and we find reasons to knock at them. And we find reasons to be mad at them. When all, when all that's really going on is the fact that we're envious that we're not with, there with them too. Y'all still with me this morning? And so we become envious of something that they have that we don't have. And Solomon's like, look, man, I looked at this. I looked at life. I see these people chasing with envious hearts after what these other people have. I've watched it. I've watched their toil, and I've watched them work hard, and I've seen this. In other words, they're chasing the other. They're chasing other people's blessings. And so this morning, the question for us that we need to ask in our hearts what is your vision of a life where you have it all? What is a vision of a life where you have it all? Chances are this morning that your vision of a life where you have it all comes from somebody else who you think has it all. That's why whatever level you're at, we're often never satisfied because we find somebody else at a higher level. Pastors want 50. They get 50, but they know somebody who has 200. They get 200, but they know somebody who has 1,000. They know somebody who has 1,000, but now they want to be on TV and have 7,000. Like, like I, I, I'm just giving you an, an example of, of what I know from people, okay? You have a nice house, but oh, my gosh, sister so-and-so did you see the house? She put a fountain on that pool that's bigger than your pool is. And we get distracted. And you think, I've got to go get that in order to be fulfilled. And I want to ask you, where did you derive this standard? Is this standard based on a biblical view of life? Everybody say biblical. When we look at a biblical view of life, look, I think Solomon was saying, look, man, I have everything. I, if anybody should be happy, it should be me. I got it all. And But guess what? I'm wiser than all of you. There's not a wiser person in the world when Solomon was around. Right? He's, been, he's, the, most wise, he's the wisest guy ever. 
But he said, man, I've watched these people. We should take some advice from a guy that God blessed to be the wisest man ever, by the way. Our standard that we chase, this chasing of the wind, should not be after what everybody else has or what someone else has. It should be a different kind of chasing. This morning, could what you're chasing after be a waste of your time? We've been teaching on the parables. I believe last Sunday, not this morning, we talked about the parable of the sower. There's a place in the parable where this, these believers, if you will, are compared to they're producing some fruit. But then this other stuff moves in and it grows up around them and it chokes them out. And these worries of the world, they start getting in the way of their spiritual growth. This morning, I want to speak directly to you. I know I'm not yelling and shouting and bragging about all the things God is about to do and all that just yet. There's a time for everything. God is trying to grow you. And God is trying to use you. He wants us to rejoice with those who rejoice. He does want us to work hard. He is okay with God-ordained goals and visions. But your happiness is never going to be fulfilled when your leader or your example of what you think makes you happy, what you think will fulfill you, is from some other person and what they've accomplished and what they have. You have a role to play on this earth. And God doesn't need your spiritual life to be choked out and messed up by the worries of the world. And I'm specifically speaking to the worries that have to do with materialism in this world. Worship team, would you come back this morning? I love the example here, and you can kind of see that I've explained it below in ways that I under like to relay and understand. Here's what the passage continues on to say. It says, the fool finds his hands and eats his own flesh. In other words, there's a correction here like, huh, for anybody thinking that you should just sit down and, you know, or, and just do nothing. Like, you're going to go hungry. Right? So you're going to end up eating, you know, like, the fool doesn't have any goals, doesn't have any work ethic, doesn't have any of this. I'm not calling you a fool. I'm just saying that's what the text says. My wisest man. Anyway. And he says, but, but here comes the balance in verse 6. He says, better is a handful of quietness Okay, then two handful, hands full of toil and striving or chasing after wind. He says, in other words, a wise person, they work hard, they have enough, their spirit is not all messed up and all wigged out over getting the next thing and this, that, and the other. There's, there's a satisfaction that comes with understanding what a healthy level of ambition looks like. And so it says, I can try to trace some ghost. I can try to chase some person. I, I, can, I can have all this toil trying this, this vain, filled, envious, spirit trying to become something trying to reach a level of status that somebody else has 
or you can be thankful for what you have. You can follow the vision that God has for your life. You can continue to grow strong and your roots can grow deeper and deeper in Christ. There can be a level of contentment in your life with the church, with the people, with the job. I'm not saying don't ever switch jobs. I'm just saying like there, there's a level of contentment that God wants his people to have because when, when they get their minds, when God's people, when we get our minds off of chasing after the wind, when we get our minds off of, off of the, the envious things that sometimes arise in our hearts, then we can rejoice when other believers rejoice. Then we can continue to weep when other believers are weeping. Then we can know that we've got, we've got some blessings, but I'm, I'm content with what God has given me. And it builds a healthier relationship with people around you. And it builds a stronger church. If you'll stand with me this morning. I want you to know that the Bible teaches us that we as believers should produce fruit. And for those of you who are wondering, that doesn't mean that you're supposed to produce tangerines or apples or oranges or, uh, you know, whatever other fruit that the Lord bless fruit. Fruit tastes great in milkshakes. Somebody say amen. I love a strawberry milkshake. I like it better than eating strawberries. But believers are called to produce fruit. That means that when God is working in our lives, we are going to produce something for God's kingdom. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for the train coming through at the perfect time. I pray that our focus this morning would start to be on what you've called us to do and what you've decided to give us and the life that you've blessed us with and the purpose that we have in you. And Lord, that we would be able to rejoice when others rejoice and that we won't be envious of those who may seemingly have more or seemingly have better or whatever it is in our hearts that we covet from them or we're envious that they have. I pray for a spirit of contentment to fall upon Cross Community Church. I pray it falls on the leaders. I pray it falls on every member. I pray it falls on every person watching, whether you're a church member or not. Lord, I ask you to give us that healthy balance of working hard for you as I'm working for the Lord, but not working for the, to impress others, but working for you and producing fruit for you. God, we love you this morning. And we praise you. Saints, uh, if you would just bear with me one moment, to, nobody looking around. Uh, in just a few moments, we want to bring in our children, and we're going to have... I'll have you sit in just a few moments, but I want to give an invitation for this first before we bring them in. It's always important that I, that I extend an invitation for those of you listening or watching or that's here this morning that maybe you're tired of chasing after the wind and you're ready to surrender your life to God and live for the cause that He created you to live for. And you want to become a Christian today. So I'm going to lead a prayer, and then this is, I tell you every time, nearly every time, this is not a magical prayer, but what I'm simply doing is, is, is praying and giving you the opportunity to pray like this in your own heart to God. So you're not speaking to me, you're speaking to God. It's just sort of a way of leading you so that you can get your relationship with God where it needs to be. So if you're not a believer this morning, I want you to pray this with me. If you are a believer this morning, I want you to pray for those who were on the edge of making that decision. Father, in Jesus' name, I admit that whew, I've lived my life chasing after other things. I'm worn out with it. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I'm a, I am a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I believe, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son, Jesus, to die for my sins and 
that he did it, that he lived a sinless life and that he died, but he was also resurrected. And I ask you to forgive me for every sin that I've ever committed. And right now, I commit my life to you, not just this moment, but I, I'm going to give my life to you. I ask you to help me to learn to walk with you and follow you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. This morning, you may be seated. If you did say that prayer, please let someone know if you'd fill out a connect card or tell your friend about it or send an email. Catch me before I leave the service. We want to know if you made that decision.